So I see the, uh, the credit market session has the coveted post-lunch slot. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to follow from George W. Bush as well. And I was joking earlier, I hope that our session is nearly as well attended as the cryptocurrency one, but uh, <laughs> it might be tough to beat given the interest there. Uh, without further ado, we do have a really impressive set of panelists, and I think I, I won't be able to do them justice by introducing each of them, uh, so I'm going to ask you all to very briefly intro yourselves, and why don't we start right over here to my right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm David Warren from DW Partners. We're a multi-strategy credit firm, about 50 people based in uh, New York City, and we cover the gamut from structured credit to corporate credit and some real assets in between, and we've been doing this for about a decade. Steven? Hi, I'm Steven Shapiro. I'm one of the founding partners of Golden Tree Asset Management. Uh, we are a $26 billion credit manager. We focus predominantly on corporate credit up and down the capital structure. Uh, we have very strong structured credit and emerging market credit as well. 100% uh, privately owned firm uh, with 28 partners in New York, London predominantly. Paul? Hi, Paul Horvath, uh, CEO of Orchard Global Asset Management. Um, we have about 60 people worldwide. We're pretty dispersed um, between Singapore, London, Toronto, Washington, D.C., and Houston, Texas. And when we're, when we're not there, we're spending a lot of time in, in Abu Dhabi. So it's, it feels like home. Um, we're an alternative private credit asset manager. Um, and we'll get into it a little bit later. But we really focus on teaming up with banks to do senior secured lending. Um, as our main focus. And last but not least, Sir Michael. Uh, Mike, Michael Hintzey, CQS. We uh, manage about 15 billion uh, across the globe. Uh, Multi-strat, but we are focused on credit. Uh, deep dive in credit is what uh, allows us to, to work from the traditional IG all the way through to distress and then on to, uh, on, on, on to uh, the ABS build. I have to say, the first time I ever encountered CQS was at your London offices, and we were talking about synthetic tranches, so I know you're definitely in the weeds on a lot of this stuff. Uh, I had a very nice intro written for this session about tight spreads and froth in the credit market, and then uh, Monday happened in the market, and spreads got a little less tight, I would say. So why don't we jump right in there? The recent volatility that we've seen in the market, let's get your take what does it mean for credit? Because to some people, credit actually, surprisingly so, didn't move that much. Paul, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'd, um, I'd like to thank the equity gods um, <laughs> for uh, giving us this little scare uh, over the last couple of days. Because, you know, for those of us um, who run credit, we have to go justify to current and prospective LPs, you know, why should you invest in credit? And um, when you go to speak to them, they say, well, you know, spreads are a lot tighter than they were in 2009 or 2010 or 2011. Oh, yes. And they say, covenants don't exist anymore like they did in 2009 and 2010 and 2011. Yes. Um, and, and subordination is a lot less than it was in 2009, 2010, 2011. Yes. So why, why invest in credit? And I think the answer is, is that um, you know, credit is more expensive than it was. And we have some of the best credit managers here who can articulate that you know, certain parts of the credit spectrum are very scary. But um, what credit doesn't do, especially senior secured credit, floating rate credit, it doesn't do what you saw happening in the equity markets over the last couple of days. I mean, you had, you had people almost jumping out of windows or getting close um, when you had the, a lot of it is also hype, um, of course, of course, not Bloomberg, but um, <laughs> the largest uh, you know, point move ever. Well, um, and we're going to talk about high yield. Here's what happened in, in the uh, U.S. Investment Grade Index. It went from 46 basis points, interday got up to 54, and settled down at 53. So um, I actually think that what happened in the markets is going to be um, kind of the part of the flag flagship marketing pitch that we're going to be using. Having said that, and maybe this is a lead-in into uh, some, some of my friends to the left and right, um, all credit is not created equal. 
There's definitely some bad credit, and I'll start off the conversation by saying, senior secured floating light credit, like it. LBO financing, don't like it. Um, growth capital, with all the fiscal stimulus that's going on in China, and now with the tax cut, the fiscal stimulus that's going on in the US, um, it's pretty interesting. The reason why the markets went up, I mean, the markets went down as much as they did, mm. was not because of financial crisis. There was too much good news. Mm. So what we try to do is focus on credit that focuses on the good news, not the bad news, I mean, not financial engineering of LBO financing, but growth capital. Paul, Hi. we're going to dig into some of the intricacies of credit, but I don't want to leave the credit versus equity story because that was a big deal this week. So, Stephen, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Sure, I'll, I'll just I'll just add to to some of the things uh, Paul just mentioned. I I, spoke, I was flying over Monday, but I spoke to our traders. Said what what was going on when the equity market? They, they weren't said, jumping out of windows. No, presumably. no, not at all. In Nothing. fact, uh, <laughs> the the markets, the, the high yield market at the depths of the. Uh, downturn Monday in equities, the high yield market kind of just froze up. Yeah. Really, n not much was happening. Things were quoted lower, but not much was trading. Uh, I think that uh, Tuesday morning, people came in looking to cover some shorts uh, and really wanting to know, are there any desperate sellers out there that I can take advantage of? So people were looking for the quote unquote jumpers. Uh, so it's still very much a buy the dip mentality, at least in, in the high yield market from, from what we saw. Right. David? I, I, yeah, I would say we're, we're used to, from the last two decades, we're used to credit markets leading, leading economic downturns for good reason. I mean, it will be most likely be tightening credit conditions, and that may be starting to happen, but just barely starting to happen, that actually leads to the next recession in developed markets such as the U.S. Uh, the equity market's going up 75% and then down 5% doesn't, doesn't do anything to credit financial conditions. All right, let's bring in Sir Michael on this topic, because I know you have some strong opinions when it comes to the impact of the unconventional monetary policy that we've seen on the credit market. We're talking a lot about the turmoil that happened this week, but before then, it was sort of the best and worst of times for credit investors in that there's no sign of a default cycle actually happening, but you do have spreads extremely, extremely tight, which suggests that most of the market is overvalued. Well, Hold on, let's, let's just go back to, to, to what a spread really is. And I mean, you know, spread, in the most simple terms, spread is the probability of default times the loss. You know, so I mean, if, you, if you're going to lose 100%, and you know, you've got a 10% probability, the spread will be 10%. I mean, that's the simple math behind it. It's the arithmetic behind it. So the point is that the equity market, to a certain extent, gives you a view on what the probability of default will be. So, you know, the reality is it's, it's a risk-adjusted way of looking at it. Yes, there's asset light. Yes, there's uh, cov light. There's all these other interesting things from our point of view to, get, to go on. But, I mean, I'm not so sure that in a QE world, those spreads were, quote, unquote, too tight, or for that matter, that the cycle was all over as, as, as it is. You, one does have to be a lot more cautious, clearly, but, you know, the, the QE world was... Um, was actually not a bad world. The, now, the quantitative tightening world is slightly different. And frankly, you, you can see what happens in a quantitative tightening world in that if you are at the triple C end of the, of the world, the probability of the default does go, go up. And uh, you know, at the risk of being a little bit geeky here, uh, we have a slide. Uh, if you look at uh, slide seven. We do have a slide. We can, if you have a, Let's see a, if this works. All right. I'm Let's in see. charge of the slides. Okay. There we go. No, that, 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 that's, that's slide five, slide oh, seven. Slide seven, all right. So, slide seven. I have to go in order. That, that, that one before. I mean, you can see what's <coughs> happened. Uh, the, the slide before, if we can. The, which is, well, anyway, what it, what it is, it talks about the, there, there we go. are. The red line is the ratio of the triple C versus the investment grade. You can see it's gone from being uh, pretty much six times the spread to almost 11, 12 times the spread. That is what's happening to probably the default in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the world of where we are. So I mean, sorry, that's a little bit too technical, but it gives you a sense that not all things are created equal. And frankly, I, I dare say everyone in this panel, that's where we make our money. That's where we get our alpha, by deep diving into the, into the credit. Well, I'm going to press you all on where you see value in the market, but first I want to know, it, does anyone here see signs of froth when it comes to credit? or? 
if you're not willing to say that in general, are there certain things in the credit market that concern you? You know, I was talking with Mike Milken earlier today, and he points to Cove Light, which a lot of people do. Stephen? Sure. Yeah. Um, there are clearly, you know, if you look at where we are in the cycle and, and the, the compensation you're getting as a credit investor, we are nine years, eight and a half, nine years into a cycle. The average is about nine years. You might argue that some of the economic policies, more deregulation, tax cuts, the fact that growth in the last eight years was uh, maybe slower than, than you might have expected coming out of a recession. So maybe you could argue uh, we, we will extend this cycle a little bit longer than normal. But we're certainly not at the beginning. We're very likely not in the middle. Mm. We're kind of mid to late or late in the cycle. Um, but one of the issues is you're getting paid, uh, you're getting paid mid-cycle uh, for late-cycle risk, and that, right. that's a bit of a discrepancy. In general, uh, the high-yield market um, is yielding about 6.10, 6, 6 6.15, about 360 over the curve. And one of the ways we look at value is we say, okay, let's say everything goes perfectly well, and we get back to our historic tights of spreads of around 300. Um, you're up about mid to high single digits, call it 7%. Uh, alternatively, if you go back to where we were just two years ago in the, in the little mini turmoil we had in the first late 15, early 16 in the credit markets, led by energy but spreading to other parts of the credit market, um, you're down around 18%. And if you say, okay, well, let's, let's say I've seen several times in my career the high yield market at 1,200 over. Mm -hmm. It's not an everyday occurrence, but it certainly happens. You're down around 30%. So you show up to the market with a, if everything goes perfectly well and there's very good reason to think it won't, you're up seven and you could be down between 18 and 30. So it's clearly not a market you just show up to and hope to do well. You have to be very careful. Um, you have to be very, uh, if you look at our portfolios, we're, we're uh, highly uncorrelated with the index. We're looking at um, very idiosyncratic, event-driven type situations. And we're finding lots of things to do, but you don't want to just show up to the generic high yield market and place a bet. Right. So let's dig into that then. You're all credit managers in one form or another. Uh, how do you actually deal with that tautology in the market, David? Yeah, I would say I've been doing credit. Our team has been doing credit for a long time. I've been doing it for 31 years. My single biggest disappointment about how investors think about the credit markets is is they think about it as something that needs to be market timed. None of you think about equities as things to be, need to be market timed. You always are invested in equities. But people think about credit as, where is the high yield market? Where is the investment grade market? It's tight, I want to get out. It's wide, like 2009, I want to get in. And just going back to what Stephen just said, there are, it's a multi-trillion dollar market. We have a little sliver of capital, and we're trying to find idiosyncratic opportunities, uh, catalyst-driven opportunities, things that require urgency and complexity, and that's what we're focused. So we're not involved very much in the high-yield markets these days. Most of our capital is in real estate-backed transactions like commercial MBS or certain asset-backed securities that are going to crystallize in a year or two and where we can find bonds at 60 cents on the dollar or the equivalent that we think are going to cash flow into 75 cents on the dollar over the next year or two. So that's the single biggest thing I'd love to do every time I talk with investors is get people away from credit has to be market timed. No, find managers, maybe it's the four of us, maybe it's others, who can find this idiosyncratic credit and give you something that has nothing to do with what's happening in, in equity markets or for that matter in the general high yield markets. So on this differentiation point, David, you say you're not in high yield. Is anyone here on the opposite side of that trade? Are you picking up high yield exposure? Anyone? Well, if you're talking about high yield bonds, I think, um, I won't speak for everybody else, but um, um, I, I totally agree. Um, first of all, now is the time when you want to be, you know, in, in equities they call it, there's markets you do stock picking. Mm -hmm. Now is when you, you, you want to do your, your credit picking. I see no reason to be in the vast majority of high yield fixed 10 non-call five bonds. I just don't, I'd love to hear if there's a reason, but I don't see it. Um, you know, Cove Light, it's true. It's, it's, it's worse than Cove Heavy, but at least it's secured. Mm. Um, most of the high yield bond market is not secured or it's, um, or it's subordinated. But there's another big thing. We're, we're credit guys, not rate guys. Um, you know, 
The only thing worse than a fixed rate when rate is going up is a 10 non-call five, so you have negative convexity. So I'm not sure if you're invested in the high yield market, if you're gonna lose more money from the, the spread widening whenever it comes um, than you will from just the, the rate move. So you sort of have two things against you. So, um, so no, I think this is the time um, not to be in high yield bond. You know, I even thought about it, it's not that easy to do, is a you know, long hard asset um, secured mm -hmm. and short the high yield bond market. The only thing is there, you do need to get your, your, your market timing right. So now I, 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 I'd like to sp speak out very, uh, very strongly against the high yield bond market. No, well, well, I mean, Paul, Paul's, Paul's, of course, right in that the market as such is, you know, is, is what it is. And I mean, I'm not sure I'd go and buy it blind, which is, which is sort of your point. I mean, we wouldn't buy it blind, but there are certain credits which are fine. And the, look, the risk, I think, which, what you were alluding to, it's, the risk is DVO1, the dollar value of, 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 of one basis point in rates. I think that's a big deal, which is one of the reasons why I think you want to go floating. It's n in my view, it's not so much the CSO1, the credit spread um, dollar value of, 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 a, of, a, of a basis point. I mean, so we've got DVO1 risk versus CSO1 risk. And I mean, I think that's, that's DVO the point. DVO1, you can look it up on your handy Bloomberg <laughs> terminal. Yeah, <laughs> actually that's true. <laughs> but uh, you know, the point is, one of the reasons why I like using, notwithstanding there's some issues, so, why I like using structured, you know, structured notes, CDS and whatever, because you can play the spread rather than the, uh, the, than the rest of the, the nonsense that goes around it. That, now, that doesn't mean that there, there, there are not certain issues that you can get in the credit default um, swap market, which, which again, you have to be very cautious about. As I say, don't do this at home without parental supervision, and even there, be careful, you know. But I mean, the point is that uh, I, I'm not sure all high yield is a problem, but you know, I wouldn't buy the market as such. Right? Yeah, I don't think the, uh, we get asked the question all the time, is, is high yield a bubble right, right. now? When I, when I look back and we talk about it internally, um, the bubbles that we've seen in, in the high yield market really are, result from, you look at situations where companies are borrowing money and you just don't know how they're gonna pay it back. Mm. That's what tends to lead, and, and the lending goes on nonetheless. Um, I don't think that's happening now. The lending is responsible. It, yes, uh, multiples are picking up, leverage uh, multiples are picking up. There's more triple C issuance. Uh, so the, the, the market is, is, is riskier, um, but I don't think we're in bubble territory. We're just in uninteresting value territory, generically. Um, that doesn't mean there's not a lot to do. There are a lot of situations out there that are, uh, if you can avoid uh, interest rate risk, uh, but there's lots of special situations out there. You look at Puerto Rico, uh, 70 plus billion dollars of debt, 100 boxes of issuers on the island, incredibly complex, lots of moving parts. We focused on less than five or six boxes, but there's some very, very compelling value opportunities in that situation. We're leading a restructuring in Brazil called OI, one of the largest telecom companies. There, there's a lot to do in the high yield market, in the distressed market, that's not taking the generic risk we're talking about overall. I want to press into this corporate leverage point because I hear different opinions on this all the time. I see some charts that suggest that corporate leverage in the States is at the highest it's been since 2007. I've seen private equity valuations that are now surpassing 2007 levels. And then some people use different measures that seem to suggest everything's fine. And with interest rates still low, the debt load isn't actually that big of an issue. So I'd be curious to get all your thoughts on where we stand in terms of the health of the actual corporate market Market, and to what degree companies are actually indebted. Uh, David, you're in the hot seat. Sure. In, in the broad markets, the, the U.S. economy is going up. Uh, the U.S. economy is in great shape. I jotted this down. The yield curve is upward sloping. Inflation is rising. The labor market is incredibly strong. Credit delinquencies and defaults are incredibly low. The ISM manufacturing index is strong. Earnings quality is strong. Housing market is strong. Financial conditions maybe slightly tighter over the last three trading days, but mm. really loose. So we're far from uh, a default cycle. So most credits, uh, I already said we don't like to own a lot of high yield just because of the spread, but most credits are in good shape. Now our president, I think for three of us and some of you out there, I'll try to put it in his terms, has these wonderful, beautiful tax, uh, tax deal, but it doesn't universally apply to all companies. So there are many high yield levered companies 
that maybe will go, don't pay tax today and might actually go from not taxpayers to taxpayers because uh, earnings deductibility has been reduced for certain uh, high yield companies. So I'm trying to say I think we're in a market where there's going to be for the first time winners and losers. I'm going to use a very, very dirty word, at least in the credit world, which is like, we have a long short credit fund. Nobody wants to own this long short credit fund because it's been almost impossible to make money from the short side. If Michael's mm -hmm. right about dispersion, um, we'll finally start to see some shorts working again. And so I do think it's a market, as somebody else already said, for stock picking in credit. And there's going to be some real problem credits over the next couple of years, even if economic conditions stay pretty high. Steven. Yeah, Tracy, if you can pull up slide 12. Sure. Let me um, try to get that for you. I want to talk a little bit about some of the risks we're seeing developing. Can I uh, get the slides, please? There we go. All right. That's the triple C performance? Yeah. Yeah. So we've, yeah. we've looked at situations. Oh, uh, was that it? Go back one. Sorry. There we, we go. We looked at uh, historically when triple C issuance is greater than 10% of the market and comes tighter than 700 basis points. And as you can see in, in the right-hand column, it's not a pretty story for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, we are now 15% in, in, the, uh, in the market today is triple C. It's coming at 581. We're not really sure why you'd expect the outcomes to be different. We've, the only time it's worked was in 05 in the buildup to the, the big bubble. Uh, but you've had down 15, down almost 40. Uh, and our expectation is you're going to see triple C's underperform in the next 12 months. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, 13, there's, there's clearly a sense of complacency setting into the, the credit markets. And we wanted to show, this is a very interesting slide where we looked at five or six companies here where the equities are down on average 50% mm. and the bonds are flat to up, essentially. And, you know, for, for most of my career, b both of these markets well, Credit's right. supposed to be the smart money, right? Well, I was just going to say, for most of my career, I remember in 2002, you had, um, people will remember WorldCom, uh, account, you know, accounting uh, expenses as CapEx or accounting fraud. You had a company called Adelphia, a cable company. Uh, which was fraudulent financial statements, fraudulent subscriber numbers. And so that spread to a lot of different companies. And, and we were looking at um, Cablevision, big cable company, terrific assets based on Long Island, New York, really good markets. Um, and their bonds were trading, I think, in the 50s at the time. And I would get on the phone with equity analysts, and they would start talking to me about what they thought set-top box penetration would be three years later, uh, what they thought the earnings multiple was four years out. And I would say to them, do you know the credit market, the bonds are trading at 50 because the credit market is not sure they're going to be able to access their revolver next month and make payroll. Mm. So this could be a liquidity driven bankruptcy. And so for most of my career, I, th I did agree with you that credit was the smart money. I actually think the equity market is onto something here. I think there's a lot of complacency in the debt market. You can't have a, a, a typical capital stack like this where the bottom is down 50%, in some cases, 80% in frontier. So are you getting long the equity and short the debt in these Well, names? it depends. I mean, these are opportunities for us to, first of all, a couple of things. Uh, defensively, uh, we're we constantly calling the portfolio and saying, what is it we may not feel quite as good about? The market mm -hmm. is giving you a chance to get out of names that you feel less confident in for whatever reason. That's number one. Number two, there clearly are single name short opportunities in situations like this. And there could be, alternatively, a lot of optionality on the equity side. Uh, so, but both of these markets can't, can't be right at the same time. So it, my point of this is there's, there's a lot, as I said before, I don't think there's a bubble in high yield right now, mm. but there's a lot of danger building and there's a lot of complacency. And what that leads us to is a conclusion that in the next 12 or 24 months, we're going to have a terrific distressed opportunity to invest in. I mean, what that slide suggests to me, and I feel bad for seeing J.C. Penney on it. Uh, my dad always likes to joke that he parks at J.C. Penney at the mall because that's where there are no cars. Um, I look at that chart and I think debt investors aren't appropriately pricing risk. And maybe equity is. Paul? Well, yeah, no, I, I, um, I really kind of agree with Steve. Um, Here's the good news and the bad news about um, the credit markets as I see it, and I'm going to quote somebody who knows a little bit about credit, um, our host, Mike Milken. Um, if you want to defend credit, um, 
what he points out is yes, leverage is high, and yes, cov, cov light is high, and subordination is lower. However, for a lot of reasons, quantitative easing and, and, and corporate earnings, free cash flow, mm. the ratio of free cash flow to interest, um, interest expense is still at all-time highs. It's a little bit less than it was um, uh, you know, six, 12 months ago, but it's still at all-time highs. And at the end of the day, you, know, you, go de you default because of liquidity. So not a lot of evidence that that's going to happen. In fact, I think that it's one of the reasons I don't like the high-yield bond market. There's a lot of zombie companies out there mm -hmm. that just aren't going to default, even though they should, um, even if rates rise um, because they've gone and issued you know, five, six, and seven percent um, bonds. But um, Steve's right, um, there is a lot of complacency. So um, the opportunity really is, um, yes, you can do long, short opportunities, but it's really back to um, where, where you brought us, is since all credit is not credit equal, is there good and bad credit? Um, you talked about real estate back. If you do so much of the middle market and direct lending markets, is your funding LBOs. Now, since it's a lot harder to do an LBO now as a, as a private equity uh, manager than it was because it's a lot more expensive to buy companies. So the only way that you can really provide value to your private equity investors is to squeeze the lenders as much as possible. So I just spoke about how I don't want to be in the high yield bond market. I also don't want to be the one who's getting squeezed so the private equity people can get good returns. Getting back to what I was saying earlier though, if you can get hard asset backed growth capital, hmm. then I think what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take advantage, as Steve's pointed out, of the complacency, get out of things where you don't have conviction, get out of markets where you're, where you're getting squeezed um, and get into those hard asset backed. Maybe it's an out of favor sector, but even if it does default, you're gonna be fine. Maybe it's an out of uh, um, favor country. Like, like, like Brazil was and Puerto Rico is, that to me is the real opportunity rather than getting into, um, unless you're very, very quantitative and very good, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, equity debt arbitrage. Well, I, I want to hear on that quantitative theme from Sir Michael. What are you looking at? Well, well I mean, the, 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 the point that Steve makes here is actually, um, I think, very, very much to the point in that the debt and the equity can give you some very, very strong signals, but that doesn't mean they give you signals which are that different if you do the full analysis. I mean, JC Penney being, being a case in point, remember, equity has got a 25 to 30 year duration. The bond, by definition, uh, actually, unless it's got a ne negative yield, but the, the, the bond has got a, a duration of the maturity at, at worst, right? I mean, so. You know, the, the point is that J.C. Penney, the debt might be able to recover 100 cents on the dollar, in which case, that's fine. That doesn't mean the equity is going to be around in the next 25 years. In which, so you have to be cautious. I mean, that said, you know, one, a couple of those names there, the, the, the equity is probably, to put it in percentage terms, is 1%, 1 and, the, and the debt is like, more like 15. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I think Frontier is what, 600 million and, and the debt is what, 7 billion? I mean, you know, it, it just get the numbers there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a massive differential there. So it's really fun to play that, but it's not necessarily the, the end of the world on, on, on some of those things. But those signals are very, very powerful. They're, they're, they're exciting signals that we, we, all, well, we all play with. I mean, it's, it's the classic Merton model, the debt equity uh, mismatch, you know, where, where, where the equity of a company is equivalent to a call and the the debt of a company is equivalent to being short of put. I mean, so you, you play that game, and it's quite, quite interesting. It's, um, but but it, it's, it's, it's fun. It's, in, it's enjoyable, and, and, um, and that's where you can make your money. Yeah. I'm not sure everyone would describe it as fun and enjoyable, but sure. <laughs> I, I think um, da, da, yes, da, we would. Yes. Yes. <laughs> everyone here on stage would. All right. Possibly Actually, the, the, not the, me. The worst markets, are, I mean, from intellectually, are when you, you come in and it's just grinding tighter. You didn't buy mm -hmm. it yesterday because you didn't think it was good value. It's tighter today. It's, it's much more fun when there's volatility, there's dispersion, and we can articulate our point of view uh, with, with uh, when there's more volatility. And we, can, we can put our convictions to work. All right, so when do we get the great dispersion? I, we saw in your chart that it is staging something of a return, but everyone on this panel can agree that we are probably late cycle, and yet no one can pinpoint what the catalyst is gonna be to push us over the edge. Mm -hmm. 
Well, wait a Can you? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we are late cycle. Mm. I mean, notwithstanding what Steve was saying in terms of these nine years, I mean, look, we, we, the Chinese have done something massive with the BRI, with their Belt Road Initiative. This is going to last another 20 or 30 years. We might be just at the start of the cycle, frankly. Mm. I mean, it, look, the Chinese are going to be putting, via other investments, they're going to be putting $10 trillion into the global economy. QE was, was $8 trillion. I mean, you know, we might be changing the world. And by the way, QE was basically in M3, mainly. And you know, this, this investment's going to be in M1. I mean, blow me down. We could actually be really pushing the, the world to a different place. So we might not be in the end of the world. In fact, we might actually be in the start of a, of, of a, of a, of a golden age. That said, we'll, we'll have some gray, oh, I've got a lot of gray hair anyway. We might have more gray hairs on the way through, you know? I was going to say that would be a very golden age for credit investors, but not necessarily for financial journalists who enjoy yeah. writing about a little bit of excitement in the market, such as this week. Um, David, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on the cycle and what yeah, would sure. actually push it Again, over. I ticked off those eight factors. Yeah. Every time historically those eight factors are pointing up, we're not late cycle, we're mid cycle. We have a very unusual <clears throat> conundrum in that spreads our late cycle and the economy is mid cycle, <clears throat> and we just haven't lived through that in a long time. What will be the catalyst? I think the catalyst will be the normal catalyst. Barring geopolitical war, the normal catalyst will be, we'll start to see wage growth. Who knows? It looks like maybe those numbers from last week might have been a head fake. We'll see. Um, in terms of uh, uh, lower paid workers not being uh, at work. But at some point, wage growth is going to go up. The Fed's going to raise rate, not just four times in a year, but five times or six times. Who lived through 1994? Anyone lived through 1994? It was a pretty tough year. And, and rates will go up. And that will start to choke off financial conditions. Uh, uh, predicting whether that will be 2018, 2019, 2020, who knows? But I think we'll have a normal business cycle, even if Michael's right and we're in a 50-year Chinese-led incredible liquidity boom. We'll get a normal business cycle, and that will be—it will be the tightening of financial conditions, and you'll see it in the credit markets, not the equity markets, and that will lead to opportunities to get into distressed again, and uh, and some of our shorts will work. Stephen, can, can the credit cycle end without having a recession or the end of the business cycle? Sure, yeah, and I, I, I don't, look, I don't think we are, I wouldn't argue we're in the ninth inning. I don't think a recession is imminent for all the reasons that, that David mentioned. I just think we're, we're probably mid to late cycle, and if you look at the, look at what's going on, the economy's getting better, rates, we think, three hikes, four hikes, I don't know. I think we're, we believe rates are going to be higher than they are today. I think people are going to be talking a lot about wage inflation. Uh, I think you have to look at companies with pricing power versus those without pricing power. But you look at, you look at a world, that presents a lot of opportunities because you have a world where triple C's are financing at 8.5%, let's say. Um, all of a sudden, as, as they have to start paying 10%, 10.5%, 11%, a lot of those capital structures won't work. So you have, you could still be in a growing economy and, and the, the, the general economy is doing very well. But you have a lot of um, you have a lot of pressures and movements within capital structures. We saw deals pulled this week for the first time at, right. in a while. I think that's that's healthy. Uh, I think a company that was going to finance at eight or eight and a half had to pay ten or more and pulled the deal. Um, those are good signs, and that will lead to opportunity. That will lead to more volatility. So I just wanted to be clear. I'm not I'm not suggesting we're in the ninth inning, but I don't think we're in the fourth or fifth either. So this is possibly a stupid question, um, but I'm curious. Do you bother hedging credit portfolios at this moment in time if you can't see that down cycle coming? And if you do, how exactly do you do it in the current environment? Um, anyone want to take it? Well, um, what we don't do is we don't um, um, very often hedge idiosyncratic risk hmm. because you want it. <laughs> that's where you make money, right? That's where you make money. Um, but you can, and this is one of the nice things about being late stage or mid-late stage or early, you know, seventh inning. What you can do, you know, there's a lot of things that um, are not fun about investing in credit now. Mainly spreads are tighter. But um, another way to play this complacency is you can hedge systemic risk, and you can actually do it very cheaply. In fact, I think you can do it cheaper than you should. So um, I know the focus is mainly on high yield, but you know, in, in investment grade, if you go into the investment grade indices, um, it's never been cheaper 
Um, I mean, here's the a strategy. The derivatives or the cash indices? Um, uh, the synthetic indices, to, to, the, to your the, point. The, the CDX. Um, the, the CDX. Um, you're not supposed to be able to do um, put on trades like the trades that, that, that the following trade that, that, that we have actually a whole fund devoted to, which is effectively a positive carry um, put option on the credit markets. That's not supposed to happen. So you can actually put on using, you know, tranches of indices and hedging with indices, you can put on 200 million of, um, you can put 200 million of an equity tranche of the CDX, and you can buy 10 to, uh, 10 to 30% out of the money put options on the very same index, um, but not 200. You can put two and a half billion of that on, and you can still have a positive carry. Mm. So what does that mean? That means if nothing happens, if we're mid-stage rather than early, you know, if, 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 um, then you're gonna get 10% or 6% or 11%. Um, if there's a rally, well, you'll do well because the stuff that you're long will rally and you'll make kind of 20% and your, your options will, 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 will expire worthless. But if credit spreads go from where they are now, around 55 basis points, 54 basis points, to 130 basis points, which by the way, that's where they were in 2013, it, because of the numbers, like, because you're short two and a half billion, you're gonna have a 50, 50 60 percent return. Mm. Yeah. If credit spreads go to the widest they ever were in the index, um, the, the, the CDX 294, which was I think in March of 09, you could have a six or seven hundred percent return. So what that tells me is um, the people who are selling you those options are being very complacent, and 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 they're under um, they're undervaluing that. So idiosyncratic hedging, very hard to do. Uh, systemic hedging right now, I think pretty easy to do. Uh, Sir Michael, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. I know you're into synthetics. Uh, Paul is talking about using them as a portfolio overlay, but someone has to be on the other side of those trades. A lot of people hearing derivatives, hearing tranches. You didn't mention basis trades, but I'm going to. They're going to think that's risky. The, the, the basis trades are now much more expensive. It's too hard, uh, very hard to get the leverage. but. So those, those, those. I mean, you, that that doesn't mean we haven't done some, but it's it's hard to do that as a as a big portfolio. But look, Paul's exactly right. I mean, it's interesting. We're on the same trade here, it's, it's, <laughs> it, 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 but um, not not quite. Hopefully, we, we do it in slightly different ways because otherwise we'll be we'll, we'll be on top of each other. But but the point is that 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 trade is there. If you do the analysis, it, it works. But perhaps the people who are doing it on the other side, then um, which I, I believe will be some of the. Um, some of, the, some of the large insurance companies will probably need to have the exposure in their way. Let's hope, because otherwise, you know, they, they'll, they'll be uh, taken away. Now, you often hear that a high net worth individuals are doing certain trades, and all I can say is they will not be high net worth very long if they do those trades in a problematic market. I mean, it's really mad, some of this stuff. Part of the volatility we saw in the equity markets just the last week, or the last week or so, is some of these guys who were short gamma and absolutely got carried away. I mean, one of the, one of the banks has stopped, or actually two of the banks have stopped actually doing any of these things. It's a, I'm not going to mention the name here, but it's, it's really is a, is a problem for some of the dealing desks, and uh, it, 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 is, it is clearly an issue. But uh, no, that the ability to hedge at the moment using those indices is actually quite, uh, qu quite, uh, quite, quite helpful. We'll have a short gamma breakout session um, <laughs> after this, but David, I saw you nodding. Yeah, just briefly, I mean, we've spent 40 minutes here in the session or wherever we've been, and we've spent 39 and a half of the 40 minutes talking about lending money to companies at 3%, uh, I guess we got ourselves to 8 maybe 10% yields. If you look at funds like ours, and I bet others, Paul tried a couple times on this panel, I guess, most of our funds are being lent on a collateralized basis against real estate, not lending against companies, and there are much better opportunities there, especially, and you don't have to take cycle risk. You don't have to lend your money for 10 years. You can lend it for two. And there's much better opportunities than anything we've talked about here, lending money to companies when everyone's rushing in. The high yield markets have never been more liquid, in a sense, because so many people want to own it for a little bit of spread. There's so many other things to do in credit beyond just the high yield US markets. Uh, I'm going to pause very briefly and just let everyone know that we are taking an audience Q&A in about five minutes. So uh, if you have burning questions about basis trades or the real estate market, please get them ready now. 
Um, I guess one other thing that we haven't really spoken about is the overall credit market structure. Uh, Sir Michael touched on it just now, saying that maybe insurers are on the other side of some of the equity market volatility we saw this week. That's different to what we would have seen before the crisis when the big dealer banks probably would have been on it. A lot of people talk about low liquidity in the credit market. How much of a real concern is that for you? I think, uh, I th I, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, please, please. I'll be short. I think, I, I actually think that um, that uh, fear mongering is way overblown. It is true that um, you don't have the interdealer broker banks there and all the sort of uh, hundreds of billions of capital to back it, but there's two things that um, make me less worried about that doomsday scenario that gets painted um, by news organizations other than Bloomberg. Um, oh, thank you. Number one, um, is um, uh, number one is demographics. And that's the one thing we haven't talked about when you're talking about credit cycles. Everybody wants to talk about QE, and, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, demographics plays a big deal. Um, right, one of the reasons there's so many people buying all these, these bloody high-yield bonds that I hate so much is because there's so many people in Japan and the US and other places where literally I talk to my, my father's 79, and I talk to some of his friends. I'm like, why are you buying that high-yield bond? <laughs> the company isn't going to be able to repay in maturity. And their answer is, I'm 83 years old. It's a 10-year bond. I don't care if they pay at maturity, literally. Um, and that, right now, that demographic um, you know, put is there. So um, there's some of the people who are on, on the other side of that. And that actually is, I think the, the, the liquidity is going to come from those, uh, those, those pensioners, either through their pension funds or through their um, high net worth accounts. Number two. Why did the equity markets wobble? Because people were worried that the central bank, there was too much good news, and the people were worried the central banks were gonna take their foot off the gas. Well, guess what? If it gets really bad, they're gonna go back to doing what they did before. So I think it's, that is just a little bit overblown. I mean, obviously we can't be complacent and ignore it, but I don't think it's gonna be the end of days as being predicted by many. Uh, Stephen, and then Sir Michael, please. Sure, I think, uh, look, liquidity, Liquidity in the market's a function of how strong the market is. The market's been very strong, so there's pretty good liquidity. There's no question the broker-dealers are committing less balance sheet, whether it's Volcker or whatever, they're just shrinking their balance sheet, so that, that is true. I think, I, I, I guess we believe ultimately a security is gonna find the right level mm. uh, to give people a return from that point. So that's where a buyer would step in. The difference now is it might get there in a more violent fashion. So you might have had someone making a, a market all the way down, in, you know, maybe down every two points or every three or four points, whereas now it might, it might get there faster. Uh, but it's gonna get to the right level to where buyers come out. Um, and so I, I do think there's less liquidity. Uh, look, a, a, a bond or bank debt trading at par has more liquidity than something trading at 60, inherently. Uh, so I do think there's less liquidity, but it, it doesn't mean, it doesn't, it has less impact, I think, on valuation. It has more impact on volatility of getting to the right point. I suppose Trump might be able to solve any liquidity issue there is with the stroke of a deregulation executive office pen. Uh, Sir Michael. No, well, look, I mean, what, what, what's been said is true in terms of the, in terms of the, in terms of where we are, but let's think about the market structure for a moment. I think it has moved on. You know, Basel III, Basel IV, light if you like. I mean, that makes the leverage ratio more difficult. You know, so the banks can't lend, they can, the, the ability for them to do repos is a problem. So there's a whole lot of technical issues here. But remember, we've got a lot more passive money out there. And some of that passive money is, is not that, by definition, it's not smart. It's passive, right? It's not active. So that, that will also be, then behave in, a, in, a, in what I would consider a less, less thoughtful way. And even more worrying to me is you have a lot more of the algo traders, a lot of the, the, the guys out there who are trading very, very quickly in the stocks. I mean, I think the average holding period of stock was, went from 17 seconds to 24 seconds. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually a huge churn in the equity market. And remember, the point is, I can see why you have a 5% drop in that. There's, there's a per, almost a perfect storm. You have less balance sheet able to be committed by the banks, the Volcker rule being one of them, you have the algos pushing this stuff around, but again, that's why you do the fundamental credit work to see if this stuff is, is available to, to, to be around the next uh, 10, 
10 years, five years, or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those, uh, those points that the market structure is pushing a lot more volatility in there, which is pr very, very good if you're, if, if you're trying to take advantage of that right. uh, idiosyncratic point. Uh, now, I did promise Q&A from the audience. Uh, it's your chance to ask some of the smartest minds in credit for their thoughts. See so one in the front. We do have a mic going around, so just raise your hand when you're ready. Hi, Please. question for Paul, actually. You mentioned how the high levels of free cash flow are a moderate mitigants to that, uh, Covlite and um, high leverage, et cetera. And I'm guessing you're saying that because of low debt service. What level of rate rises would you expect to see to sort of tip that inflection point into a, uh, a negative performance? Um, yeah, and I, uh, that, that, that's a great question. And it speaks to, um, you know, most people, it, it speaks to one of the black swans that we should all not be complacent and have in our playbooks. Um, most people are thinking about, you know, what if the, you know, you know, 10 years getting close to 3%, what if it goes to 4%, what if it goes to 5 you know, Well, you know what? It was at 5% in, in 07. And so I think that um, if it goes to 4 or 5%, like most people think in their downside scenarios, then, um, that's not going to be enough to sort of, you know, tip the balance in a significant way. Where I, where, what I like about your question is that um, while I don't think it's going to happen for the demographic and central bank reasons I just articulated, you do need to actually look at what happens if you're, if you're talking about, you know, um, 7, 8, 9, 10% uh, scenario, because anything in that would, um, you, you know, would, would be a major problem. Don't think it's going to happen, but I don't think enough people are doing the math to know what's going to happen in their portfolios if it does happen. Questions? Questions? Hands can up? I, can I uh, oh, just follow please, up? please, Stephen. Pull up slide 14. Oh, uh, sure. Would. One of the reasons the free cash flow is so good is because so much slide, of the, bar please? Can so I much of the borrowing uh, is going on. Um, yeah, this is the slide. So much of the borrowing now is going on at the senior secured bank debt level, which is the cheapest part of the structure. So th there have been some really important structural changes in the market that are worth pointing out. We, and I would say we still like loans, but, but we just want to point out this, this risk that we think is building. Um, when I started my career, a traditional LBO would be a eight or nine times buyout. You'd have three multiples of senior secured debt, three multiples of true subordinated unsecured debt, and then the rest in equity, kind of two or three multiples. Well, what's happened, if you look on the right, Purchase multiples have gone up, whether it's interest rates or money flowing into private equity, but purchase multiples have gone up. And because everyone for the last five or six or seven years has been so worried about rising interest rates, a tremendous amount of money's flowed into uh, bank debt funds because they are LIBOR-based and you're protected against rising interest rates. So it doesn't take long for the bankers to figure out with their clients the cheapest part of the structure is incredibly liquid right now, and you, instead of doing three multiples, and this is, I think, why Paul hates LBO debt, uh, instead of doing three multiples, you would have seen 15 years ago, why not do five to six times multiples with the cheapest amount of capital, with the cheapest part of the structure you can? And so if you go to the next slide, Tracy, yep. what that means is the subordination and the cushion uh, is much lower. The, the tranches are thicker of first lien, and so the subordination is lower, and in a restructuring, my, my whole career, we've been, I've been uh, trained that banks recover about 70 cents as a good rule of thumb. We think in this next cycle, the recovery rate will be 60 or lower. Now, that may not sound so dramatic, except when you realize that this is what populates CLOs. Uh, and, and so there's gonna be a very significant effect, we think, in parts of structured credit. The other thing I'd point out is, in a traditional restructuring, if the banks are getting 70, maybe the high yield, the unsubordinated bond might get 25 or 30. If the banks are getting less than 60, that recovery is gonna look probably more like 10 or 15. So th there are some serious knock-on effects of, of the fact that the first lien tranche has gotten so wide, and that's the reason the free cash flow, it, it all works well while it works, but then it stops working at some point. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'm gonna start talking about credit enhancement and CLOs, and no one wants that. There we go. Yeah, So Michael, Paul, Stephen, David, if you could be any one of the other panelists on here, 
with their strategic thinking, who, which one would you be? Who would you be? I have never heard that question asked at a panel That's before. easy. If I, were doing, if I were doing quant, I would be with this guy. If I were doing high yield, these guys are the best high yield managers in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. And if I were doing real estate, I'd be with that guy. Are you running for office? <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be a knight. That, uh, that sounds pretty good. All right, uh, let's move on, because otherwise we're going to start asking that university question, what animal would you want to be? Um, I saw a couple more hands go up, just yeah. in the back. Um, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your insights. A uh, couple of questions. Michael, you touched upon um, a passive, the, the amount of passive money that is currently there uh, you know, in the credit markets. Have you factored the fact that the ETF universe post-2008 has sort of flourished and there are a lot of credit ETF funds. Um, and it seems to me from some of your slides, what happened the past week on the short, short gamma trade being smoked out uh, hasn't quite happened in the credit trades uh, thus far. Mm -hmm. The credit ETFs on the, in the passive money that is out there. How are you factoring that change in the market structure, if I may, uh, in, in, into your analysis? And the second question is, I didn't hear a lot of discussion about emerging markets. Um, can you kindly give your insights on what are your views on uh, emerging markets, and particularly which pockets of emerging markets you most like and don't, most don't like? Sure. So let's do market structure, and then we should definitely end on EM and energy, because obviously that's important for this region. Okay. So, okay. Michael. I'll, I'll try to be brief on the, the ETF point. There, there is a significant mismatch in liquidity versus of, of the ETF versus the underlying, especially in the loan market. I mean, that, that is something that, that you can bridge it technically, but frankly, that is a, a, a real issue. One of the things which we do when we, when we go into some of these names is to see which, e and you can work out where they are, which ETFs own what, especially if, you, if you're being a little bit more aggressive on it, to see where, you know, what, 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 where that is. So that is very much part of our analysis, because again, by definition, it, 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 it does actually impact, impact the price. And gee whiz, when you see some of these uh, credits smashing out, you do actually want to know who's got it and in what, in what hands they are. Because again, they're very much, they're, they're not driven by intellect, they're, driv they're, they're driven by, by, by a calculation machine. So, you know, that, that can give you a real value if you're buying at the right place, or it can be a real, a real mess on the other side. I mean, you know, we'll see. So that's part and parcel of our, of what of the analysis through which we have to do. And I, I dare say, most other, uh, you know, a good number of other people, people do it. Um, if we look at the emerging markets side of that, your question, again, uh, I'm just saying follow the money. You see where 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 the uh, where the global money flows are going, and you and you and you, and you see see where it is. Now that, that and then you have to do the fundamental uh, analysis because again, you can say yes, some of the EM spreads are tighter than they have been, and so on and so forth. Whether they're their, uh, their sovereign EM spreads or, or individual names spreads, but again, you, you have to do the analysis, I, I, I fear. Uh, Paul, we yeah. have seen an uh, amazing boom in EM issuance in recent months. Yeah, but, um, but um, actually that's one of the places where I do th think there still is value. Still got to do the stock picking. But you know those crazy multiples that Steve had? You actually don't have that in many EM markets. And um, you know, uh, so you can actually, you know, part of the um, make America great trade, uh, make, make, make America great again trade that's going on, the fiscal stimulus that's going on um, in our country, and the fiscal stimulus that's going on in China, if you pick those emerging markets that are going to benefit from what China and what we're doing, um, I actually think there's tremendous value there. But there too, stick to those countries that are growing, stick to those industries that are going, growing, and those companies that are growing. You, there's n enough return in emerging markets where you don't have to do the financial engineering, which is so much of the, you know, the, the European and, and US uh, credit markets. Stephen and David, is anyone not bullish on EM debt at the moment? No. What are you most bullish on in the space then? We, we, we actually do like EM. We, we are excited about some of the things we're seeing in EM. There are some really interesting trades. We have a terrific EM team at Golden Tree, and they're finding some very interesting trades in, for example, some of the regional debt of a country like Argentina relative to the sovereign, where you have actually better credit statistics in the regions, and yet they trade 150, 200 wide to the sovereign. So 
we, 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 there are parts of VM that we like quite a bit. All right. Um, I'm afraid we are actually out of time, um, but I'd like to thank my panelists, uh, Sir Michael, Paul Horvath, uh, Stephen Shapiro, and of course, David Warren. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really a pleasure. Thank you.